Bueno, pues le paso la palabra a Eric Sommers. Como he dicho, Eric Sommers viene de Ámsterdam, de del NIOT, del Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Y él nos va a hacer una presentación de un poco qué es el NIOT y por qué eh, y cuál es el contacto que el NIOT tuvo con Yehane, quien expuso su, esta exposición allí y un poco esa recorrida. Ok. Uh... Thank you very much for the introduction, but uh, above all, um, thank you very much for inviting Johanna and her uh, and her work for uh, presenting the exhibition in the Peace Museum of Guernica. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce myself and, the, and our institute. Um, we have uh, our institute, the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, uh, presented the exhibition of Johanna last year and um, we decided, we both decided, this is a very important issue and an important work to show it in Spain as well. And due to our um, relationship in the uh, Bose Institute, the museum here in Guernica and our institute in Amsterdam, we both are members of the International Network for Museums for Peace and so, um, well, the links are very close, so um, we made contact and uh, we are very pleased and happy that we could manage it, that the exhibition can be presented here in Guernica. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, introduce our, our institute. It's, um, in the, here you see our building, it's in one of the canals of, uh, of Amsterdam in the old city. And our institute is founded uh, three days after the liberation in May 1945, after the end of the Second World War. And uh, founding this, uh, this institute, it had two main reasons for that. And the first one was to documentate what has happened during the Second World War under the German occupation. To uh, and, and the reason was to witness what happened during the war. And first of all, we did it by collecting archives, material about, uh, about the history. And the second one is writing history. Um, initiatives for this institute were made in occupied Netherlands, but at the same time also in London, where the Dutch government uh, was in exile and they made already plans how we can witness what happened in the war so we had to found an institute and for instance um, during the war in 1944 and 1943 the Dutch broadcasting the radio uh, facilitated by the BBC in London they made radio programs for the Dutch during the occupation and they did an appeal to the to the people that they have to uh, take care of their notes, their memories, and they write down and they collect it for our institute. And one of the people who listened to that radio broadcasting was Anna Frank. And when she was listening to the radio about this, uh, about this appeal, she decided to rewrite again her diary. And after the war, the diary came to our institute. And um, as you all know, it's now one of the most famous um, um, memories uh, written during the war. In, uh, in first instance, our institute was uh, mainly focused on the history of the Second World War. But in the following decades, the institute has developed itself into a knowledge center about effects of war, the Holocaust, but also other genocides, effects on individuals and on society. And um, well, uh, these days our our research field is is broadened, and the and the ambition of of the of our institute is as a knowledge center to make visible links with war violence elsewhere in the world through independent research with a strong civic focus and to show that the long lasting consequences of violence do not stop at national borders. So we are not just research and archiving the past, we have also a res responsibility to the society and um, so we are also showing and asking attention to moral aspects of 
history. And um, for instance, um, by cooperating with all kinds of partners, national and international, uh, and also by making, for instance, exhibitions. And in that sense, we play, our institute play a major role in coordinating of all kinds of museums in the Netherlands relating to the history of war and peace. We make an exhibition by ourselves, but uh, we also have a task to stimulate initiatives which are uh, in line of our, of our vision and our goals. For instance, the exhibition which is shown now here in, in your museum, the exhibition of uh, Memoria Historica by uh, Jana. Um, I won't go in detail about the exhibition, that will jo Johanna do later on. Um, I will tell you just in a slight um, a, a, a slight observation about culture of memory and what I call the fascination with uh, with the past. Um, as uh, as Spain is sized in one way or another by an interest for the history of the Spanish of Spanish Civil War and the period of the Franco regime, so are the Dutch preoccupied with the history of the Second World War in the Netherlands. And um, I will share some, some observations with you about the, the Dutch fascination for the history of the Second World War. And at the same time, I ask you to examine to what extent <coughs> these observations can apply to the Spanish <coughs> fascination for their own past. Um, in the Netherlands, the Dutch are preoccupied on the history of the Second World War and the aftermath. Um, the German occupation of the Netherlands and the murder of more than 100,000 Dutch Jews, that's 75% uh, of the Jewish population. Um, in the Netherlands, you can conclude that for the Dutch, the history of World War II is not just the most influential historical event in the last uh, this, uh, century, but it appeals as well to universal values <coughs> as freedom, oppression, and self-responsibility in the years after the end of World War II. The expectation is that for the time being, the history of the Second World War will continue to speak powerfully to, uh, to the imagination. And the significant element herein is the present day meaning attached to this period of the past. In a fluid and multiform culture of memory, the period between 1940 and 1945 has remains above all a moral reverence point. The history gives meaning to the here and now and indirectly to the future. In recent <coughs> years, the memory of war has been increasingly linked to attention to universal human rights issues and themes, and this can be expected to continue in the future. And in this context, the issue are ones of universal universality and, and globalization. <clears throat> At the same time, however, the focus on universal values is linked with concrete, imaginable, local and personal histories. And after more than 70 years after the end of World War II, <clears throat> there is still strong interest in the Second World War. Memories of the Second World War in all its forms of expressions and rituals are deeply rooted in Dutch society. The memory remains, but the way it is expressed is continually changing. That's, for instance, what museums are doing. They keep the past alive and contribute to the historical consciousness and this formative historical episode. And talking about culture of memory, you can divide several dimensions of memory. You have the individual memory, you have the social memory, you have the cultural memory, and you do have the political memory. The first dimension is the individual memory. And this memory is linked with the personal, <coughs> with the persons who have witnessed the period itself. They have experienced the events themselves. They have strong personal direct memories. They have, and they have forwarded their memories to the next generations. But as it goes, they will die. And at some point, there are no more living witness, witnesses. You could say at this moment that we are at a turning point. The first generation will disappear and living history becomes real past. 
And the, the second dimension is what we call social memory. And these are linked with the new generations. They don't experience the war by themselves, but they are strongly tied with the history of the first generations, their, pi their parents and our grandparents. They are grown up with the stories of the past, are educated about the past, and you can say that their lives are rooted with the history. They are receptive to the past. You can say the individual memory has been adopted by the social community. And these generations developed their own memory. They give their own interpretations of the past. That means their attention for the past remains, but the shape, the representation will change. The past is remembered in different ways and at different places imagined and experienced. The cultural memory is what we call the materialized shape of the memory. How it's carried out or how it's performed in, for instance, films, in musicals, in websites, on literature, uh, computer games, but also museums, museums and, uh, and exhibitions, and especially with the presentations, the war museums in the, in the Netherlands, but elsewhere in the world as well, constitute an appealing expression of historical culture. I just want to mention in brief a few characteristics of these recent changes we, uh, of the memory at these days. And um, uh, one of them is, you can see in presentation, there is more and more kind of particular, particularism, fragmentation of the memory. And that's due to the increasing individualization of society. And um, so you can say everyone is developing his own history or at least his own interpretation of history. And the second characteristic is that new generation wants to compensate the loss of the first generation to make the past more concrete. They want to get an idea of the past to imagine the past. They can realize, realize that by visiting concrete memorial places or other historical places, for instance, uh, the beaches of, uh, of, of D-Day, but also with confrontations with historical objects. And there was a strong wish to visualize the past, and that can of course be realized by visiting museum, museums. And I think that's one of the most important reasons of the growing popularity these days of historical museums and World War II or War and Peace museums. And the third characteristic is uh, bringing back historical processes to individual stories. It makes the past understandable well, because people want to identify with personal stories. And one of these effects of this personalizing the history is that people want to have icons to reflect on. And uh, Anna Frank is one of the icons, but I think the painting of Picasso, Guernica uh, as well. The last dimension uh, of memories is the, uh, the political memory. And that's the memory sanctioned from above, for instance, the state or the government. It's an institutionalized memory influenced by spokesmen of the past. And sometimes there are strong political reasons to present a certain image of the past. For instance, to create a desirable national identity. You can say uh, the political memory is a controlled memory. I will give you an example of this, this political memory and how it can be abused or, or misused. Um, and I will show you at the same time how we can deal with this today in, for example, an artist um, impression and in an, uh, in an historical exhibition. And in this sense, um, I think the exhibition we're going to see later this afternoon and Johanna will uh, explain more about it is uh, the work of Johanna and how she is dealing with an mm -hmm. official history and about a, a reason of truth finding, to find out the truth, what happened beyond it. And uh, that's one of the ways how you can deal with a, a political memory. And uh, I want to make a little um, comparison. Um, I won't go in detail once again to the Memoria Historica of Johanna. She will do that and you can see it. Uh, I will show you something about um, the, an exhibition which has been recently showed these days in Amsterdam in the uh, 
Resistance Museum, and that's an exhibition about the Dutch colonial war in Indonesia. This colonial war has been for a long time, even in the Netherlands, a quite unknown history. It's about the wish of independence by the former Dutch colony, the Indonesian people, and this was violently fought by the Dutch army. The main similarity between the exhibition of the Memoria Historica about the Franco period and the Dutch colonial war is that both exhibitions are about a painful part of our histories. It's, you can say it also, it's a kind of pain in the ass. It's about how to deal with a sensible history. It's a dark side of our own histories. The question is how to deal with the past, how to overcome the past and how to tell a real history, how to give prominence about what happened. It says something about how societies deals with a dark past and in that way it gives insight into the ever-changing culture of memory. At this exhibition, Colonial War, Desired Image and Undesired Image, it's about imaging and how the Dutch controlled media reported on what happened. It was a bloody war, but the Dutch government and the controlled media gave a friendly and peaceful image. They want to believe that the Dutch were doing a good job in Indonesia. They don't want to upset the Dutch society. They gave a false picture of the conflict, in fact. The Dutch army, army was there for peacekeeping, but in fact, they were fighting a war. And beside that desired friendly image, there were pictures that were not shown. The censor had kept them away. They were found many years later in private albums of veterans or were hidden in archives. Without the image of violences, there seemed to be no war. And this exhibition shows another light on the past and it has to do with truth finding and gives also insight in how manipulation of public opinions works. And in this sense, I think the exhibition of Fiana and the exhibition of the colonial war uh, has the same ends and, uh, and goals. I will, uh, I will end my, my presentation with, uh, um, with showing uh, a kind of introduction to the uh, exhibition of uh, less than two minutes. And, mm -hmm. uh, I thank you for your attention.